Before humans became good at burning fossil fuels, the flux into the ocean was closely balanced by the flux out of the ocean. The rise of anthropogenic atmospheric CO2 has turned minor source areas of the ocean into sinks. Now we'll take a look at inorganic carbon and water chemistry here. CO2 dissolves in the water and generates carbonic acid. We can see that with this equation here. So atmospheric CO2 sourced by a coal power plant, for instance, is going to combine with water vapor. And the net result is carbonic acid that's going to make up a component of the rainfall. When we talk about carbonic acid, we need to consider bicarbonate and carbonate ion equilibrium as well. In this case, the carbonic acid dissociates in water, releasing a hydronium ion as a positively charged hydrogen atom. In this equation, carbonic acid is going to be converted into the hydronium ion and bicarbonate. This is going to regulate the pH. When the hydronium ion concentration increases, the pH decreases. When the concentration decreases, the pH increases. Thus, more carbonic acid would dissociate to balance the two forms, and the reaction is going to shift to the right. The release of the second hydrogen ion converts bicarbonate ions into carbonate ions, as so. Here we have bicarbonate releasing a hydronium ion and a carbonate ion. By adding CO2 from the atmosphere to seawater, the pH is going to go down. It's going to decrease, affecting the relative concentration of the carbonic acid bicarbonate. Here we have CO2 dissolving, forming carbonic acid, reaction number one. The carbonic acid is going to dissociate, forming bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. This is reaction number two, which in turn is going to cause the pH to decrease. When the pH goes down, the water becomes more acidic. The hydrogen ion then reacts with the carbonate ion, forming another bicarbonate ion, the reverse of reaction number three. So this brings us to the overall chemical reaction that describes the uptake of atmospheric CO2 as the sum of these three reactions. Atmospheric CO2 plus carbonate plus water equals carbonic acid. This means that the carbonic acid system acts as a buffer in the ocean. Unfortunately for us, the amount of carbonate ions in the ocean is insufficient to buffer it against all fossil fuel use. We're swamping the system with CO2 these days. Now this brings us to chemical weathering. When atmospheric CO2 dissolves in water, raindrops become acidic, they become carbonic acid. This carbonic acid results in rainwater with a pH of about 5 to 6. This is unpolluted pH. So we can generate rainwater with lower pHs than this even. Rock exposed at the Earth's surface is exposed to this acid and therefore it's exposed to chemical weathering. Crustal rocks are composed primarily of two types of minerals, carbonates and silicates. Just a quick primer here on pH before we go into that. Here we have a pH diagram that goes from 0 to 14. The pH of 7 is considered neutral. This would be the pH of distilled water no ions. If we add a little CO2 to the atmosphere, we generate rainwater that with this carbonic acid decreases in pH until we get to around four or so. In the case of extreme environments like volcanic lakes, the pH can be quite low. The water can be quite corrosive. A couple of years ago, a guy went swimming in a hot spring in Yellowstone with his sister, which apparently is called hot potting and he was dissolved. Uh, he was dissolved before the rangers found him. So his sister reported that he was in boiling water, and by the time they got back, he was gone. So that would be typical of volcanic lakes, very acidic. On the other extreme, we have desert lakes. When I was a grad student, we were taking samples of some weird lakes out west in the U.S., and they had enough carbonate in them. The pH was high enough that when we added acid to fix the sample, it would actually foam like opening a can of warm coke. So that's the extreme high pH. And in between, we have seawater right at about 8.3 pH units usually. And that happens to be the same as our blood chemistry pH. So when exposed to rain, carbonates and silicates are both going to weather chemically. The carbonates are going to dissolve a lot more rapidly. They're more susceptible to acids than silicates. And this chemical weathering is going to neutralize the acidity of carbonic acid in the same way that an antacid neutralizes the acidity of your stomach. That's why people take things like Tums 
which I believe are dolomite. So you're actually consuming uh, carbonate minerals to neutralize the acid in your stomach. So in carbonate weather terms, we have this equation. Calcium carbonate, calcite for instance, plus carbonic acid yields a calcium ion and two bicarbonate ions. Whereas when we weather silicates, like a granite, or in this case, wellastonite, CaSiO3 plus two bicarbonates is going to yield a calcium ion, two bicarbonate ions, silica dioxide ion, plus water molecule. Silicate weathering consumes twice as much carbonic acid as carbonate weathering does. And we can see an example here. This is from the Little Bighorn in Montana. This is where the uh, famous Custer's Last Stand took place. And we see two types of tombstones here. A marble tombstone, this is calcite that's been metamorphosed. This is very soft, uh, it's cheap, so they're often used for inexpensive grave sites, like military grave sites. On the other hand, this person had some wealthier friends, so they returned about 10 years, almost 10 years after the incident, and they replaced his carbonate tombstone with a granite tombstone. Uh, diorite, it looks like. So this is a much more resistant, chemically resistant tombstone than this one. Now remember that these were put in, this was 1876, just after the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and this is a fairly dry environment, uh, so chemical weathering is limited here. If this is in a moister place, a wetter place, a warmer place, then uh, perhaps these uh, this writing would have been dissolved by this time. And of course, if you go there, everyone wants to see where Custer fell. He fell here. He's not buried here. They removed him and put him somewhere else. An even older tombstone is here. This is St. Patrick's grave in Downpatrick in Ireland. And uh, this was put in, I'm not sure when, probably around 1,200 years ago. But Patrick died around 1,500 years ago. His real name is Ermaulin Sukkot. So this rock you can see is exposed to lichens. They're chemically weathering a rock and acid rain that's falling on the rock is also chemically weathering the rock. When we talk about carbonate mineral deposition in the deep sea, we need to consider other things that are being deposited. Diatoms, radiolarians, sponges are gonna remove silica from seawater, whereas foraminifera, coccoliths, corals, and shellfish, shellfish meaning clams and snails in this case, are going to produce solid calcium carbonate, aragonite or calcite, in the formation of their shells and or skeletons. When we look at the sediment of deep sea basins, we find areas with lots of calcium carbonate. Here in the Atlantic, we find lots of calcium carbonate right along the mid-ocean ridge. And that's because the mid-ocean ridge isn't as deep as the rest of the Atlantic. Same out here in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. So that means depth has something to do with the preservation potential of calcium carbonate. Some carbonate producers like coccoliths and plankton are able to photosynthesize organic matter. And this is going to drive the dissolved carbon system in the opposite direction towards lower CO2 concentrations. They're taking CO2 out of the water and they're making organic matter with it. That drives the concentration down by producing calcium carbonate as a mineral they drive the CO2 concentration up. So there's a balance between these two. The majority of phytoplankton don't produce carbonate skeletons at all. So the overall effect of biological production near the surface of oceans and lakes is in favor of reducing CO2 concentrations. It's a net sink for CO2. CO2 wants to come out of the atmosphere and go into this surface water. And on average, the ratio of organic matter to carbonate mineral production for plankton is about four to one a lot more organic matter is made than carbonate. Carbonate producing marine organisms remove the calcium ions and the bicarbonate ions from seawater in the precipitation of calcium carbonate via this equation. Here we see the calcium ion being combined with two bicarbonates yielding calcium carbonate and carbonic acid. This change in the ocean's chemistry forced by the precipitation of this calcium carbonate shell material increases the carbonic acid concentrations and at the same time reduces the bicarbonate concentrations as well as the pH and the concentration of CO2 in seawater. The change in the ocean's carbonate chemistry 
is induced by precipitation of carbonate skeletons that increase the carbonic acid concentration and reduce the bicarbonate concentration in seawater. This is going to have an influence on the pH, and it's going to have an influence on the CO2 concentration in the water as well. By increasing the concentration of dissolved CO2 in surface waters, carbonate-producing organisms are going to increase the CO2 gradient between the ocean and the atmosphere. Essentially, it's making surface seawaters a source of CO2 to the atmosphere. Here we can see some carbonate producers in Belize. Most of these things you can see that aren't fish are carbonate producers. Some of these soft uh, gorgonians are um, kind of an organic matrix as opposed to calcium carbonate, but otherwise these are all calcium carbonate producers. And just another image here, using my head as scale, you can see the erosion, the bioerosion caused by fish chewing up this coral and producing this finer grain sediment. Ultimately, some carbonate producers like coccolithophorids, which are a form of plankton, photosynthesize organic matter, driving the dissolved carbon system in the opposite direction towards lower CO2 concentrations. So the manufacturing of organic matter lowers the CO2 concentration, whereas the production of calcium carbonate increases the CO2 concentration. When we add everything up, however, the majority of phytoplankton do not produce carbonate skeletons, thus the overall effect of biological production and surface ocean activity is in favor of reduced CO2 concentrations. On average, the ratio of organic matter to carbonate mineral production for plankton is about 4 to 1. So most of the carbon action is going in, into organic matter production as opposed to calcium carbonate production. When these carbonate producing plankton die, they sink to the bottom. Generally, they're consumed before they sink. They form these little fecal pellets that look like footballs being fired into the deep water. If the total water depth is less than about 4.2 kilometers or so, in general, these carbonate particles will accumulate on the seafloor. And because of this accumulation, we would consider these waters saturated with respect to CaCO3, calcium carbonate. If this material remains in saturated state, in these saturated waters, they can eventually become lithified as limestone. Most limestones, however, form in shallow tropical waters where reefs and other carbonate producing organisms live directly on the seafloor. And we saw those in the Belize examples a minute ago. Deeper waters have higher concentrations of CO2 due to decomposition of organic matter and are therefore considered undersaturated. This means any fine grain carbonate material in that water is subject to dissolution. And the way this was determined, and I believe it's still determined, is by placing polished calcite spheres into pairs of pantyhose and lowering those pantyhose into the ocean to various depths. And you leave them there for a period of time, recover them, clean them off, and weigh them. And you can tell how saturated that water is by the amount of dissolution or the lack of dissolution of these calcite spheres over that period of time, whether it's a year or five years or so. This particular calcite sphere is from a website. Uh, apparently, this is good for your solar plexus and your navel chakras, if you're having issues there. The level at which the rate of dissolution of carbonate sediment balances the flux of carbonate settling through the water column is called the carbonate compensation depth, CCD. You might see it called the calcite compensation depth as well, and in rare situations, the aragonite compensation depth, or the ACD. In a freshwater environment here, we talked about this a little bit in the last lecture, I believe. We're going to take a look at upstate New York, the Adirondack wild region. Here we can see principally crystalline bedrock. By crystalline, we mean silicate rock. Lots of gneisses, granites, a wide range of metamorphic rocks that are mostly silicate. Now here's an image, a satellite image of the Finger Lakes. Syracuse is located right about here on Onondaga Lake. A number of Finger Lakes here, some of which these lakes in the east are situated in carbonate bedrock, whereas these lakes to the west are situated in silicate rock. And there's a difference in how these water chemistries relates to atmospheric CO2 based on the bedrock they're sitting in. So we published this paper a few years back, and the big surprise here was that acid rain actually resulted in the production of calcium carbonate. This is counterintuitive given that acid dissolves carbonate. 
But in this case, the acid is dissolving carbonate rock, and that carbonate rock is then in the dissolved state supplying calcium and bicarbonate ions to the lake water, which is then used by calcareous algae, in this case freshwater algae, in producing calcium carbonate sediment. Taking a look at the more ancient record of carbon isotopes in carbonate rocks, as a measure of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere over geologic time scales. Again, we talked about this a little bit a lecture or two ago. Essentially what we're going to look at here are a number of carbonate producing algae, Halimeda, Penicillus, Rhyphocephalus, Acetabularia, and Goniolithon, with another species of Goniolithon down here. These are the carbonate producers, they're algae, they're very common. They produce the bulk of the carbonate in many coral reefs. In these environments, these shallow tropical environments, bioterration, the mixing of sediment by shrimp, ghost shrimp in this case, supply fresh organic matter to deeper layers of the sediment pile. And it's in these deeper layers of the sediment pile, which are anoxic, where this organic matter is consumed by sulfate reducing bacteria that also generate alkalinity and hydrogen sulfide. This is the rotten egg, stinky smell that uh, you experience in the sulfate lakes of southeastern Saskatchewan and any near shore marine environment that's kind of stinky. It's usually because of this uh, hydrogen sulfide. Here's an example from Western Ireland. We were coring a series of carbonate producing lakes there. This is a 330 million year old Visean limestone, a marine limestone that's been exposed for, oh, I don't know, probably a couple hundred thousand years in Ireland on and off when there are no glaciers present. This is exposed to rainwater and now acid rainwater that's going to tend to dissolve these rocks and supply the calcium and bicarbonate ions to this lake. And you can see the carbonate being produced before your very eyes here, this light colored sediment. Now we would core into this sediment by hand and we would recover at the top this material, peat. This is essentially pure organic matter. This is the type of material that would become coal if it was compressed and heated. Below this layer of organic matter, as you can see again here, we have pure calcium carbonate. This is the mineral calcite, tiny grains of calcite. It's about 95 to 98% pure in this case. When we look at the carbonate cycle in global geochemical terms, here we have the carbonate silicate geochemical cycle. After inorganic carbon is involved in chemical weathering and carbonate mineral precipitation and is removed by sedimentary burial. So we're gonna produce some carbonate minerals and we're going to bury them they become part of the sediment pile or sedimentary rock. Eventually, plate tectonics is going to drive that material down a subduction zone. When that material is driven down the subduction zone, the water that's present, the carbonate that's present, and the organic matter that's present all get cooked together. And the net result is metamorphic and volcanic CO2 input to the atmosphere. So we're taking that carbonate, we're taking the organic matter, we're taking the water, driving it down the subduction zone, heating it up, and those volatiles are being released. Water vapor, H2S, bicarbonate, CO2, methane, all these types of gases are gonna be released by volcanic activity. In the case of metamorphism of carbonate rocks, here we have a transition from calcium carbonate, CaCO3, with the addition of silica, to CaSiO3. This is the mineral wollastonite, or the uh, simplest version of the mineral wollastonite, plus CO2 is given off during this carbonate metamorphism. So a summary figure here, we'll start with rainfall. When rainfall increases, the rate of silicate weathering increases because again, rainfall is a corrosive liquid that's being dumped on rocks. It's going to dissolve them. When these rocks are dissolved, that CO2 that made up the acid rain is neutralized. So we end up with a reduction of atmospheric CO2. The partial pressure, the PCO2, is going to go down. That's going to reduce the greenhouse effect, which in turn is going to reduce the surface temperature, which in turn will reduce the silicate weathering rate. 
On the other hand, if we reduce the silicate weathering rate, we stop uplifting mountain ranges like the Himalayas, then CO2 in the atmosphere can increase. That increases the greenhouse effect, increases surface temperatures, increases rainfall. It also increases the amount of CO2 in that rainfall, therefore speeding up the weathering process, the weathering cycle. We can see this weathering cycle enhanced by other biological activity. Here, this is the image from Tintagal, which is in Cornwall, the southwesternmost portion of Great Britain. This is where Land's End is located. You've heard of the clothing company. It's, it's a real place that's about, oh, 10 miles from here. This is more commonly known as the legendary location of King Arthur's Castle. So while we're here though, we're looking at these rocks. These rocks are covered with this material known as lichens. Uh, these lichens aren't werewolves. That's another lichen, but it's spelled different. These lichens are a mixture of algae and fungus, and they essentially burrow into the rock chemically, dissolving the rock to provide nutrients to these plants. Tree roots do a very similar thing. The root hairs work their way into cracks and crevices in the rocks, producing acids that dissolve those rocks, freeing up nutrients from those rocks. So plants are actively involved in this carbonate system, this weathering of carbonates and the production of carbonates, all very strongly tied to plant communities around the world. And that wraps up carbon cycling.